So today I want to think a little bit about sequencers and ways of implementing a basic sequencer in Max MSP. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some ways of doing things a little differently than you would otherwise be able to sequence in a DAW or a modular synthesizer and some of the cool things that Max MSP allows us to do. So first, what is a sequencer? Um, Alan Strange in the, the classic um, early 80s book, uh, Electronic Music Systems, defines a sequencer as a programmable memory of non-fluctuating control voltages. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about old analog synthesizers where a control voltage is what would be used to kind of... Um, change parameters and control element or modules of a synthesizer. Um, so we can read control voltage as value. But here, what Strange means by non-fluctuating, that means stable, uh, predetermined values like tuning a note on a, on a scale. So by moving through this memory, this set of non-fluctuating values or voltages, we can essentially program uh, melodic patterns. So a very, very basic synthesizer might look like this. So let's say it's a four-step sequencer. That means we have four sets of stored values. So step one, we might have the value of A. Step two, we might assign B. Step three, C. And step four, D. And so if we were to then step through that sequence, we would get the values A, B, C, D. And traditionally, you would end up kind of looping the steps so we would just get the values out of our sequencer a b c d a b c d a b c and so on so let's look at how we can implement a basic sequencer in max now i have started by pulling up a fresh max patch um, and um, the first thing that we need to think about is how we are going to move through our step sequencer, okay? How are we going to count through those four steps, one, two, three, four? Well, the way that a sequencer works is it's driven by a clock, okay? Um, it's driven by something that periodically allows us to step through. And in Max, I'm going to just use the simplest version of this. I'm just going to use a metro object, okay? It's a, a metronome, basically. Um, and when I start the metronome running, we're going to get periodic kind of bang output, okay? So something that just clicks along, in this case, at 200 milliseconds, okay? And that's going to be the thing that drives our sequencer. So if we want to change the speed of our sequencer, how quickly we move through those steps, we're going to change the speed of the clock. Now, what we need now is to kind of move through our our sequence in 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 sequence our steps in sequence um, and i'm going to do that by by count by using the counter object to count through so we are going to count in the first instance uh, up to four steps we're just going to count in increments of one so counter allows us to kind of count in you know um in in two or or, or three or four or, or even kind of count in other directions as well so we could put like i think minus one allows us to count backwards um we're just going to count real straightforwards from one to four um, and you should see now as i output there we go we've got just sort of moving through in sequence counting one to four done easy um that's 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 it that's the kind of that's the thing that drives the sequencer okay that's going to just sit up in this corner up here uh, and that's going to be how we kind of count through our sequence. Lovely. Don't need that anymore. Now, what we want to say now is, okay, when I get to a certain step of, of our sequencer, do something. Um, so we need to know kind of which step we're at. We need to kind of move through. And if you've ever seen a kind of hardware synthesizer before, particularly one of the old kind of style with like buttons for each step, um, you'll kind of know the, 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 the layout, the architecture um, of the kind of blinking light that kind of moves through one, two, three, four. Uh, we're going to do something similar. I'm going to use the select object um, or cell, S-E-L. And it's dead easy. I'm just going to say cell one, two, three, four. And I'm going to hook it up to our counter. And what that does is that says if the input so our counted number is one, put a bang here, 
if it's two, output from the second outlet, three, and so on. So what we end up with is this kind of step, stepping through one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, at this stage, what we could do is we could say, uh, we could hook this up to, uh, to a value. So let's say um, 34. Um, let's kind of just try this, 34, 36, uh, 38, and 40, let's see what that gets us. Now, um, because I want to focus on thinking about um, sequences today, I don't really want to spend too much time thinking about um, kind of synthesis and, and triggering. So I'm actually going to cheat now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, just use a MIDI kind of make note to um, speak to Ableton Live, where I've got a um, drum machine set up. So all of the kind of heavy lifting of the, of the audio that we're about to hear is all just done. Well, that's the default MIDI driver. If I use this uh, loop MIDI on, on Windows, I use a virtual MIDI, MIDI router, um, which is going to allow me to... Okay, so um, Ableton is kind of doing all of the heavy lifting there, and we hear the MIDI notes being sent out of Max into uh, my 808 here in Ableton. Um, and we can kind of let that take care of it. So let's turn that off. Now, um, meanwhile, this is fine if I can kind of go in and reset and you see that I had to kind of tweak some of the numbers just to get them to map up to the MIDI note. But um, I kind of always think when I think of sequences of the old kind of hardware, particularly like the Buchler music uh, easel with the, the sliders, um, that's kind of how I think of it, being able to kind of get in and tweak the tweak the kind of values of each stored step. Um, so let's very quickly um, do that. I'm just going to swap out the static message numbers with sliders. Okay, here we go. Um, so I've just swapped out those numbers um, for, for sliders. So they're outputting values from zero to one, two, seven, and then I'm just doing a little bit of scaling just to get them to sit nicer. I'm also quantizing the scale in, in Ableton so that it's just playing a kind of natural minor scale. Um, just because again, I didn't want to spend too long thinking about that aspect of things. At the moment, the important thing is that as a user now, I can kind of move these and generate new values for my sequences. So now each of those steps, one to four, represents a value that I can just kind of nicely set here. And um, it wouldn't be too difficult at this stage to just kind of open this out a little bit. So a four step uh, sequencer is, is, is obviously quite repetitive. We've got not, we've not got a lot of um, kind of flexibility here. So more common is, is, is something like an eight step sequencer. So I can very easily um, expand out to that by kind of copying out, adding here, five, six, seven, eight, um, kind of connecting those up, connecting to our central point here. And then finally, just changing my counter. So instead of counting from one to four, I start counting from one to eight. But maybe you caught that just as I changed the um, just as I changed the variables. One thing that I don't like about this method of of kind of adding kind of uh, values or voltages in the old sense to, to a step sequencer by using sli like sliders like this is that when I change the slider it outputs that number regardless so particularly with MIDI this is a problem in that as I change these notes you'll hear those notes fire look it's not that it waits for us to get to that step of the sequence to, to, to kind of um, pull that number we kind of get it whenever anything changes which means 
It feels like I don't really want to change too much in case I get that kind of midi gliss run. It's not my favourite process. Although it does sound nice. Okay, so what could we do instead? Well, let's get rid of this. Let's try a different approach. Now, I'm going to keep the same kind of nuts and bolts. I'm going to keep the same uh, counter. That's all fine. Uh, but now I'm going to use something a little bit more elegant. I'm going to use a multi-slider. Now, my multi-slider, um, I can kind of drag it out here, make it bigger. And then in the... Um, Inspector over over here. I can change the number of sliders so I can set that to eight and then I'll change my range So instead of going from minus one to one, I'm going to go from zero to one to seven again and then let's um, Just make it a little bit more Clear what's going on. Let's have some candy cane colors now What I can do with a multi slider is if I hook up this so we can see, this is going to show me what we get. I can move around all of these and get all of these different values. Um, now this is the this is the full list of all of those values, and you see as I change, I get these. Uh, but they're defaulted to decimal numbers, uh, which is not particularly helpful for us working with MIDI, but it's fine. Um, and so instead, I could use this, and now it's only going to output when I change. Um, when I change my, my value, but I need to use a different trick because just working with a big list of numbers like this at this stage is not particularly helpful. So let's get rid of this. Instead, a really, really lovely feature that the multi-slider has is um, it, it uses this argument fetch. Now, if you've not seen me use, or you've not used the $1 um, argument before, essentially that's kind of a placeholder. It means input. So when I connect this up, effectively what I'm going to be saying here is fetch me, let me just pause this, the third number of these, the third, the value of the third slider, okay? So um, fetch from here the whatever inlet I receive, and then we're going to output it down here. So if I were to connect that now, what you'll see is we're just stepping through these values. Now I can connect it back. And it doesn't change until we get to the step. Which I think is really nice. I think that's a lot more kind of intuitive, a lot, well, a lot less of a pain to actually kind of get in there and change some of those values. But also, it opens up a really interesting possibility for us. Because we're working with a list of numbers now, rather than kind of, you know, a slider over here, another slider here, or a separate one over there, because they're all in one place and they're outputting as a list, as I showed you a second ago, so we have this number, okay? Because we've got that big array of numbers, we can kind of work with that in interesting ways. And Max has um, quite a nice way of working with lists, lists of numbers, and that's the ZL suite of kind of objects. Now, um, if I pull up the help file here, you'll see, look, I've got this whole tab, I've got loads of different kind of operations that it will let me use to kind of work with a list. And one of those, one of my favorites, is ZL.scramble. Now, what I could do, is I can hook this up, so I take my value of all sliders, put that over here, put that there, and then I'll just hook up a little bang there. So when I hit this, okay, let's keep things neat. When I hit this bang, no, sorry, I need to reinitialize the list first, the first time I do it, don't worry. There we go. Now, what I'm not doing there is I'm not just randomizing all of the values in my multi-slider. I'm scrambling or shuffling the numbers that are already there. So I can see this more clearly if I just zero everything, and then I just take one up here and one down here. Now, 
I can do is when I scramble this, I won't get new values, I won't get new notes, but they will move to different locations, to different steps of the sequencer. So we're randomizing their location, but not their value. And that's a really, really nice feature, particularly when we're working with kind of melodic ideas and melodic kind of patterns and things. That can be really, really useful. Um, although the same is, is true, I guess, of a, of, a, of, a, of a drum kit, right? So if we had just um, like a, a kick and a snare here, scrambling them is not going to change that they're a kick and a snare, but it will change where on the beat they fall, which is really nice. Okay, you might be thinking, but if the point is that a sequencer allows us to set values, kind of why would we then want to be flipping them around and randomizing them and just doing it like that? And I guess, you know, if we were doing, if we were scrambling it at every beat like this, there would be no point. That would be useless. We may as well be using a kind of random number generator, uh, which is good for other things, but but for here, it doesn't really al allow us kind of much use. Um, although it's, I guess it's interesting that you could kind of know the value, but not necessarily where it's going to come out. That's maybe a, a, a useful kind of application of that. But I'm now going to demonstrate my horrible ability to explain maths by um, saying, okay, well, what if we were to just scramble or just shuffle our pattern once every four bars or once every four loops? And that's really easy to do because of our counter. It has this feature called a carry flag output, which is a basically the number of loops we've run. Okay, so at this point in the video, we've run 279 loops of this, of this pattern. Which is good to know. Um, but what I'm going to use is the Medulo object. Now, um, essentially, I'm really sorry, computer scientists and mathematicians alike. What that does is that tells you the remainder after you divide it by something. Um, so if I were to do Medulo, what, what, let me show you. Essentially now we just get a number between one and two. So if I were to do essentially what that's saying is every two repeats scramble. Okay, we could do the same thing, let's say four. Right, because it's every time that number resets to zero, every time we get to zero, we scramble, which is every four repeats. Which is a really nice feature. Um, it's not something that you could do with kind of a hardware sequencer, right? You, you aren't able to kind of move around where they are because if they're fixed in front of you, that's sort of where they are. You can't just all of a sudden flip this slider over there. So I think that's a really kind of interesting possibility that it allows us to do, particularly when we start thinking about automatic or generative music, being able to kind of move these things out. Um, what else? Okay, a, a nice little trick here. Okay, this is this is just a little aside because I think it's funny. Um, I mentioned Alan Strange at the start of this um, video, and he wrote the manual for the Buchla easel, um, which is another synthesizer I've I've mentioned a few times. And he kind of has this idea of a pulse a pulsar sequencer. This is going to be helpful if I just have a slightly different number here. So I'm just going to do this while I talk. Um, and essentially, he says, well, what if instead of uh, outputting, you know, melody, what if we changed the clock with our sequencer? So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to take my output. So this is our number, which we're sending to a MIDI value, but it's also going to output a new number. Uh, sorry. I'm just going to send this over. Let's see what we get here. Thank you. 
so these sequencer values, these stored values, I'm now using to control the clock, which I think is is just really fun. I mean, we end up with some interesting phrases, actually. I think there's a lot to be said about playing with with this and plan, kind of trying um, trying different things. I mean, you could also do a sort of very let's just change this. You could do a very kind of Mark Fell extreme of this and just say, all right, every beat, let's just put it out up here, every beat is just a completely random number, which can be very kind of chaotic, um, particularly if you were to do something very silly like this. Right, so every time that clock moves, we get a random number, which is less than what we started with, which is kind of nice. Um, but anyway, I, I, I just like the idea of sequencing the clock as well as kind of more common musical values like pitch or something like that. But yeah, that's a, that's a quite a nice approach to sequencing in, in Max and in kind of a, I think, a sort of elegant way of doing it. Well, that is until uh, Max for Live came along. And when Max for Live came along, so that's using Max uh, and the kind of Max architecture inside uh, Live, they, they sort of took care of a lot of this stuff and gave us loads of new objects like Live dot step, which kind of does it all for us, sort of takes the fun out of things a little bit. But seriously, it does do some really interesting things. It allows us other layers of kind of velocity control. Uh, you can see them in the background there, these values. Um, you know, kind of, it allows us a piano roll, which is obviously super useful. Um, and you can kind of do interesting things here. And I think it takes some of the same features as um, kind of regular live, like fold and things like this. And we can obviously change the size of this. And it still works with our counter. So you see here, I get this visual feedback of where we are in the in the in the sequence, which is quite nice. Um, now there is also this feature, live dot grid, which um, looks a little bit horrendous when you first load it like this, but I think. Um, how would I do it? I would take out some numbers because we've got too much stuff going on here. So let's just take this down to a grid of four. Mm. Let's get rid of the directions. We don't need that. And now all of a sudden we've got something that looks a little bit more like a kind of something that would be useful for kind of percussive step sequencing. So same deal again. Let's take my counter. And we move through and then out of uh, this sequence here, out of the output, we get whichever one to four. Uh, so let me just So there you see the number and also I think there's a way of doing a polyphonic mode. Maybe that's in the settings somewhere. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, you can also make it polyphonic by using the matrix mode where I can kind of have nothing and I can have multiple kind of uh, instances sort of output. So you'll see that whenever it kind of moves onto one of those, I get multiple numbers. I could even have all, all kind of few, all four of those values, which would be really interesting if you were working with kind of a limited um, like set of samples, for instance, and you just want to trigger them. So this um, trigger sampler or trigger sequencer is um, also a kind of classic sequencing thing whereas instead of it's a little bit like what we the example we gave of, of kind of fixed um, fixed version so let me just get rid of this a second get rid of this um, what we would have is we might use a gate essentially to determine whether or not we're going to allow one of these triggers to come through so we would need the same thing that we had before, the cell one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we would take it out here. 
So essentially, instead of having, you know, whereas before we just had the, the bang come out every single time, we would instead have to select whether we want that step to kind of fire. So Now I'm connected up, but as you can see, nothing is firing because I haven't selected it. Whereas if I were to f allow the gate to let that message through, so now we could start to kind of just play out. So this could be particularly interesting if we um, if we were working with uh, let's let's use the example of percussion again. Let's have them all connected up here. Now this could be my kick sample, and any time it fires, I'm going to get that kick. So let's switch back to you. There we go. Where's my hi hat? Now that's fine, it gives us a rhythm, but it makes me think of a different possibility, which is well, why does this only have to be one thing? What if we kind of used a kind of coin toss method? So I could, let me replace this. With this. Now, I'm gonna, anytime we do this, anytime we trigger this with our pattern, I'm gonna generate a random number between zero and 100. I'm gonna send that, I'm gonna split it. So if that random number between zero and 100 is lower than 50, I'm gonna get one output or one outcome. And if it's higher, I'm gonna get another. Try that. So I'm using my trigger sequencer to kind of give myself a pattern, a rhythm. But I don't quite know what it's going to be. It's going to be a 50-50 split between whether it's, in this case, a closed hat or an open hat. That's still kind of a really interesting thing, even if I were to just take this back on for a second, so every time it fires. And we end up by kind of generating more dynamic, more fluctuating kind of sequences within a sort of defined sequence. It, it, it's nice doing this because it allows me to kind of inject like rests and things as well, which I think can be kind of interesting. So it's this kind of finding this space between being able to set things, store them in memory and recall them, but also finding ways to kind of inject a little bit of unpredictability, a little bit of randomness into the, into the process, which I think can be really, really valuable. And I think that's something that Max allows us to do relatively easily um, compared to kind of you know, the normal confines of hardware sequences and things like that. So, um, like everything in Max, there's always a dozen ways of doing kind of the same objective. So I'd really encourage you to kind of play around with these basic forms and then see where they go. I mean, this whole, you know, the, the coin toss method, the 50-50 the chance of where you go, that could, be, that could be branched out into more kind of examples of this. Um, it could be applied to different things, different kind of scenarios. It doesn't have to be a percussive thing as well, like you could have this by maybe, maybe this is telling you which octave to go into, okay? So we have a melody with the multi-slider version that we used earlier, but we're also offsetting the melody every time by generating a random number and kind of offsetting that. Maybe you could do that. Maybe you could do really, really intricate um, kind of pulsar sequencing and changing the, the pattern and changing the rhythm and the tempo of your clock. 
you know, there's there's lots of ways in Max that we can take um, a kind of a value, take an output of something, and feed it back into the input of something else, like on a modular synth. But here on Max, we've we've kind of got limitless supply of patch cables. And we've got a lot more opportunity to find places to kind of put them in, um, and and kind of you know scale them as needed. So yeah, I encourage you to kind of have a play around with this, have fun. Um, and yeah, enjoy sequencing in Max. Thanks.